Can I um, welcome members to the 13th meeting in 2018 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, can I welcome Tom Arthur to his first meeting of the committee and can I thank David Torrance for his contribution to the work of the committee. Um, Alison Harris has submitted her apologies. Um, I'll formally welcome Mike Daly and Mike Homeyard to the meeting in a minute. Um, can I just say that before the evidence session begins, there's a couple of pieces of business that we must decide first. Um, first is a declaration of interest in, according with, uh, in accordance with section three of the Code of Conduct. Can I invite Tom Arthur to declare any interests relevant to the remit of the committee? Good morning and thank you very much, Convener. I'm delighted to be joining the committee and I can confirm that I have no relevant interest to declare. Okay, thanks Tom. Uh, agenda item two is a de decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that we take items six and seven in private. Those are, um, item six is the amendment at stage three to the Civil Litigation Expenses and Group Proceedings Scotland Bill. And item seven is uh, relevant recent developments in relation to the European Union uh, Withdrawal Bill. Does the committee agree to take these items in private? Okay. Uh, so we'll move on to agenda item three, uh, consideration of the prescription Scotland bill. This is the fourth of our evidence sessions on the bill. So we have with us before us today Mike Daly, solicitor advocate and principal solicitor at the Govan Law Centre, uh, and Mike Homeyard, money advice consultant with Citizens Advice Scotland. Uh, the two Mikes, so well, that could be interesting. Uh, can I welcome you both to the meeting? And we'll open the evidence session and we'll move uh, to the first question from Neil Finlay. Hey, thanks, uh, Convener. The uh, Scottish Government have suggested that um, the exception for council tax and business rates in the bill um, is likely to be unchanged, um, making these debts subject to 20 year prescription. Um, but there has been a suggestion that some councils may treat that differently uh, and apply the five year. Uh, uh, prescription. So, uh, in your experience, maybe can you advise us what your experience has been of that in terms of uh, pursuance of debt? I think uh, I think it's unfair to have uh, 20 years prescriptive period for council tax. I mean, the position is six in uh, England, and ultimately, if you if you go back to the Law Commission's discussion paper, clearly. The idea, which I think was quite laudable, was to have clarity, to have simplicity, to have certainty, uh, and it was to have all legal obligations subject to a five-year prescriptive period. <clears throat> now, I think that principle is absolutely correct, and in an ideal world, I would say that it should be five years for council tax, it should be five years for everything, but Governor Law Centre appreciates that clearly the bill doesn't make provision for that. There's exceptions. So what we would suggest as a compromise for the committee to think about, if we're not going to get the ideal position of five years, uh, and that would be <clears throat> that for those uh, statute obligations that have uh, uh, been ex accepted, I would suggest sh they should be subject to five years with uh, a, a test in terms of exceptional circumstances. And the exceptional circumstances test that we would propose would be if there's been willful, false or misleading information by the debtor which has resulted in a material delay enforcing the debt. Now that's a position that uh, is the case in Malta uh, for tax, so that it's a six year prescriptive period but it can be extended if there's been willful misleading. And the second scenario is if the creditor can show that there's been a delay enforcing the obligation um, and it was not a material delay on its part by sitting on the debt. So ideal situation is five years for everything. If we're not going to get that, it can't be right to have uh, these exceptions for 20 years uh, for all of these different uh, categories uh, because it doesn't actually fulfil the Scottish Government's uh, aim to have that simplicity, fairness and clarity. Mm -hmm. Did you say the is six years? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we would agree uh, from Citizens Advice Scotland point of view that uh, five years would be long enough. Um, we have issues uh, where advisors are um, talking to clients about council tax debts that are uh, 15, 18 years old. Uh, the client has no recollection of whether these debts have been paid or not. 
Um, so uh, they can't get bank statements going back to that period of time. Uh, and the council, on the other hand, may have changed the systems. So the old debts are on legacy systems, can't actually prove that the debt is owed with a statement of account. But the sheriff officer is still pursuing the debt. So uh, from a fairness point of view, uh, just like with any other debt situation, uh, one that carries on that length of time uh, is going to be quite difficult for consumers to contest You know, if there's a, a, an issue as to whether that debt is actually still due. Mm. But if you had discussions with the government about this, you know. But I mean, what I would say is that if you, I mean, in terms of Mike's point, which I completely agree with, uh, about these 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 old council tax debt that do kick around, how come we would have twenty years for that when we've ultimately this Parliament uh, has had to rectify the old poll tax debt, which kicked around for a very long time, mm. in England and Wales, uh, it was uh, it was extinguished in terms of liabilities. We didn't do that in Scotland, I think wrongly so, but we did get round to doing it not that long ago through this parliament. So it seems to me it's incongruous to say, let's you know, not have people subject to 20 years of poll tax debt and, and, and so on and so forth, and yet for council tax, we're going to extend it. Uh, you have to remember that every single payment that gets made under the five-year prescriptive period just extends that five-year prescriptive period. So. You know, a debt, a council tax debt that starts now, uh, could still be being collected in 18, 19 years' time, uh, just because it, it, there's a payment being made and the uh, five-year prescriptive period has been renewed. Um, so, you know, having the 20-year long stop is a good thing, obviously, but, uh, you know, with a five-year prescription, a debt can still carry on for a very long time. And uh, I don't know whether there's any... There must be some basis of truth in this, but um, the Law Society suggests that um, some councils are deliberately um, not pursuing that because of the surcharge that's added, the 6% surcharge that's added in terms of the debt, and that actually there's a benefit for them. Have you had any experience of that, or do you think that is well, happening? Well, I mean, certainly what I've seen happen with, with council tax debt is local authorities uh, going for sequestration. So, I mean, if somebody's a homeowner, um, it's quite, it could be quite pernicious because... What happens is if you have uh, over uh, three thousand uh, pounds of, of of debt, then the local authority can petition for the sequestration of the homeowner, and that happens. I mean, that happens every single day in this country. And if it does happen, and there's equity in the property, which there often is, if certainly if somebody had done a right to buy, for example, then the trustee uh, in bankruptcy has a legal obligation to realise the assets on behalf of the creditors, and you end up creating homelessness. I mean, you say there that, you know, if we're not going to get this, I mean, why shouldn't we push as hard as we can to get this? You know, don't, you know, Mr Daly of old, and uh, he's a campaigner, and I'm sure that if we push hard at this stage and campaign at this stage, then we can get this done. So I would I'm certainly hope that we're not packing our hand on this at this stage. I think, to be fair, I think, I mean, Citizens of Ice Scotland and Govern Law Centre are in complete agreement that, that, that the Law Commission was correct yes. in its original premise, which, in terms of the purity of the principle, you know, why not have five years? Um, and it seems, it seems very uh, peculiar that it, it's going to be six years in England. And as Mike says, the fact that you make a payment continues the other five years. So it's kind of like unnecessary for council tax. But as I say, that, that's what we would prefer. But if we're not going to get that, then, then better than having the 20-year kind of stopgap would be, can we get a compromise to make it exceptional, uh, if that's a fallback position? Okay. Um, well, thanks very much for that. Uh, of course, the role of this committee is, is to scrutinise the bill and to suggest amendments, put forward amendments, so you never know. Um, now, the, the Law Society... Uh, suggests that the exception for council tax and business rates uh, is unfair for other reasons. Uh, for example, it refers to the um, unfairness unfair to people who in good faith believe they've paid their council tax and yet many years later may end up being sued in respect uh, of their own share and other people's shares due to joint and several liability. Uh, the Law Society comments on the difference of approach in Scotland to council tax and business rate debt compared to England, where, as you've said, a six-year limitation period applies. Um, so do you, want, do you want to comment uh, on, on their views? Um, you've dealt with a six-year bit, um, but 
what what about the the sort of difference of approach and what, what about this sort of joint and several liability issue? Um, I have to say I, I, I agree with the Law Society of Scotland's uh, point that <clears throat> uh, that's the complication with council tax that, that, that it does if there's two people that are living in a property uh, as whether as tenants or owner occupiers they're joint and severally liable for that and we do know that it's very common for relationships to break down in life for people to end up getting into other relationships so this does create um, I mean actually what it does is it creates the uncertainty that the Scottish government originally framed and requested the Law Commission to do this bill for because this bill is all about clarity simplicity fairness uh, and I think it does do that in, in some respects but uh, I think I think what's happened is that the, 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 perhaps the beautiful butterfly of the bill, which was in the discussion paper, you know, as a, as, as a, as a concept, uh, with, with the process of consultation and, and lobbying, uh, has perhaps become a moth. A butterfly and a moth. <laughs> <laughs> Let's figure that one out. Mr. Home, yeah, perhaps you can work that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Uh, yeah, I would agree uh, with the Law Society's point about uh, joint and several liability as well. It's, it's quite difficult when you have uh, marital breakdowns, uh, relationship breakdowns, uh, and you know, one person's coming in to see you for advice who, as far as they know, have paid in good faith uh, towards the council tax, but the other partner hasn't. And uh, you know, that person can be pursued for up to 20 years. Uh, after the last payment for the other person's uh, share of the council tax. It, it doesn't seem fair. Okay. All right. Um, question for Stuart MacDonald. McMillan, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. no, thank you. Good morning, panel. Um, certainly, Section 3 of the Prescription Bill and Section 38 of the Social Security Scotland Bill is that the five-year prescription would apply to overpayments of devolved Social Security benefits, uh, but 20-year prescription uh, to overpayments of reserved matters. And given that, uh, that we're looking at this prescription bill in the Scottish Parliament, uh, uh, one could then therefore presume that prescription is a devolved matter and uh, the Scottish Government could presumably therefore not give the Department for Work and Pensions the exception uh, from uh, five-year prescription if it wants for reserved matters. Uh, so which approach do you favour in relation to uh, prescription and reserved social security debt? Uh, is it the five years or the 20 years? And um, it would be helpful if you can provide any, uh, any examples uh, in your responses. Clearly, for the same reasons as we've already outlined for council tax, we would be looking at uh, a five-year prescription period uh, as being uh, best fitted to the system. And again, with the DWP debts, uh, we would like to see a five-year prescriptive period as well. It won't make sense to somebody who is claiming a Scottish benefit and a UK benefit that they can be pursued after five years um, for one debt, but not the other. Um, so there needs to be some sort of consistency there. So we'd agree with CPAG on that point. Um, in terms of uh, examples of where things can go wrong with DWP debts, um, one example that we came across quite often in giving advice was um, people who came to claim their state pension would come in and see advisors when they got the first payment because they found that the first payment was short of what they were expecting and it turned out they were getting a deduction for an overpayment of benefit many years previously or a social fund loan and again in many cases they couldn't actually remember having had even claimed the benefit. It's just that they claimed benefit for a short period of time, went into work all the way up to retirement age, and in the meantime, this overpayment or the social fund loan was sitting there festering away and not being dealt with. <coughs> Going back then to the DWP to ask for the evidence of how this came about um, is very tricky. Um, they don't often have the records to show how that situation came about, and the claimant by that point has long lost any documents that they had um, to show that they were making payments towards it. Yeah, and I, I mean, again, going back to the Scottish Law Commission, uh, one of the reasons that we have prescription is for the very point that Mike's uh, uh, illustrated, which is that as a matter of public policy, you know, evidence and recollections from witnesses deteriorates over time. So I, I think I think I agree with Mike. Let's go back to first principles. It should be five years. And uh, what I would say in terms of your specific point, uh, Mr. McMillan, is that think about it from the point of view of fairness. So uh, somebody who's receiving Social Security uh, benefits, uh, 
if, if they think an injustice or a mistake's been made, they have to do a mandatory reconsideration. They normally have a, a month to do that. <clears throat> it could be extended in certain circumstances. And generally, there's a month to appeal. So think about the social security system in terms of the UK system is utterly, utterly geared into a fairly uh, restrictive uh, uh, you know, um, uh, position whereby you have very little time to actually ever challenge anything. And yet we're going to give 20 years for reserve benefits. I think it's completely uh, unfair and inequitable. And I think, I think you're right to say that, that the law of prescription, and indeed when it comes to pursuing matters in the courts in this country, it is devolved to, to this parliament. Uh, and I would certainly hope and encourage that the committee um, uh, seeks the bill to be amended uh, so that we have five years for all social security benefits because that would be fair. Yes. But um, <clears throat> certainly just on that then, in terms of the benefits that actually are reserved and that we have got uh, no control over, uh, but on the issue of prescription of them, so you're then suggesting that, uh, that they, should, they should be the same? In terms of if things, for example, were to be enforced through, uh, through courts, mm -hmm. in, in terms of one of the difficulties that we always have is that there is provision in the Social Security uh, Acts um, for deductions from benefits. Now, I, I fully accept that, that the Scottish Parliament can't legislate in that regard, but I do think we, we, can, we should maximise what we can do uh, with the powers that we have uh, to have that uniformity. And as Mike says... If, if you're somebody who's receiving uh, a combination of devolved Scottish benefits and, and, and UK ones, you're going to be in a right uh, uh, guddle. Because they're not, therefore, not actually be a, a potential um, devolution uh, issue uh, that could arise from that uh, if we, um, from the Scottish Parliament, uh, could be considered to be meddling in, uh, in a reserved area. Uh, that uh, that is not, and I see you. I see you. are smiling, there, Mr. Daly. Um, that uh, if, if we don't actually have that particular uh, power, uh, particularly in the the, the eighty five percent of the reserved social security area, so um, so could that then potentially highlight some type of um, constitutional uh, argument between uh, the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, and the UK Government? I think we've already got one, haven't we? But I mean, I think, I think we've got more than one. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I can get in the queue. But I think mm. um, uh, no, I take your point, and and you know, it's an absolutely fair and, and, and proper point. But what I would say is that surely we must do everything that's possible, and perhaps get the Scottish government to to to, to relook at this and look at what we could possibly do, and perhaps you know put that to the or indeed put it to the minister uh, when the minister comes to this committee. Um, could also clarify something here. The um, system as it is in England is that they have six years to recover the debt through court, yeah. the DWP debts. But what they'll do after that period of time, as Mike has already said, is take an ongoing uh, deduction from ongoing benefits uh, for an overpayment. And they can do that any time after six years. Yeah. In addition to that, they've also got powers under the Welfare Reform Act to do a direct earnings attachment. So anybody who's working, the DWP can go to their employer and ask them to make a deduction from their wages without a court hearing or anything like that. So in England and Wales, they have six years. So Scotland to have five years for the same thing would actually make sense. And then, as we've said already, they still have other powers in which to recover money, uh, which would hopefully deal with the UK-wide um, Issue. Finley has a supplementary. Um, when I worked in housing, the, you know, the, uh, I would be able to recall all the um, the limits on backdating of benefits, certain benefits. I mean, that's a while ago. So, um, at, at the moment, for example, uh, say for reserve benefits, what's the um, time scale that someone will receive backdated payment? whether it's been an official error by the department or another issue? How, how long is it normally? Sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I mean, it used, to, it, used to be, it used to be a year, but I need to double check. Um, yeah. Because the yeah, a year, and I would say probably a year is, for, you know, given the, the atmosphere within the benefit system, a year's probably been chopped even yeah. since then. Yet we, so even if there's a benefit error by the department, you can only go back a year for the entitlement, but yet 
if the individual makes an error, we can go for 20. Yes. Well, well, well that's, and I think it's less as the same. You know, the days when I used to do social security tribunals myself, um, you know, so, but certainly, I, I, I mean, as we've said, it, there's, it makes no, there's no logical sense to have 20 years for the DWP uh, because, and I do think at the end of the day, I mean, in terms of Scottish courts and in terms of enforcing in Scottish courts, I can't see how it's a reserved matter, I have to say. It's a basic yeah. element of justice and equity in this, that if it's, if it's, you know, on behalf of the claimant, um, you can only go back a year, but on behalf of the department, the, at the opposite end, you have 20 years. There's just something grossly unfair in that. It would probably be worth Mr Finlay us checking whether it is a year um, yeah, for, be, for yeah, a session so next yeah, week. Yeah. 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 Have you got any other questions, Mr McMillan? Uh, yes, sir, yeah. thank you. Um, certainly, Mr Holmier, you, you touched upon the, the CPAG um, evidence uh, a few moments ago, and certainly um, I think your, your reply was quite helpful, but uh, certainly Mr Daly, um, uh, the, the CPAG evidence, they suggested uh, they didn't favour uh, the exception in Section 3 uh, of the bill for tax credits, uh, is that something that uh, that you agree with? Yeah, no, I mean it, absolutely, and, and and we come back again to the sort of the you know the the, the first principles, which is that it should be five years as a generality, and if we're not going to get that concession from uh, from the minister, uh, then let's look for the exceptions to ha to make them exceptional, because because the exception I mean, it must be absolutely ludicrous uh, to have twenty years. For uh, for all these different exceptions, I mean, why would you need 20 years? If you look at the provision, say for defective products, in terms of this comes from the EU directive, in terms of you know product liability, it's 10 years, you know, pan-European. Why have we got 20 years? 20 years is a legacy that goes back. I mean, these these acts all go back what to 1469, 17, 1474, 1617, and you know, I mean, how come we've ended up with 20 years? And I do think it's 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 a historical legacy. And I could see no basis for why we stick to that 20-year period, I have to say. There, there's also a, a joint and several liability with tax credits as well, which we've already discussed in regard to council tax. So the same issues could arise there. Okay. Uh, and just a final question, just it's regarding the, um, the issue of uh, the council tax debt and uh, the overpayments, um, and also with the, the differential in terms of the time. Um, what practical difficulties do you actually face when trying to deal with uh, and help clients uh, in defending uh, their particular claims? Well, I mean, the, 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 dif the difficulty is in terms of nobody's got any recollection. I mean, I mean, I mean one of the things I, I was hoping to raise with the committee is, I think, an issue that the bill has failed to address. <clears throat> and that's the appropriate date for the start point for for um, for the five-year prescription to, to start because that's set out in um, Schedule uh, 2 uh, of uh, the bill. Sorry, that's Schedule 2 of the 1973 Act. And it's quite a complicated formula. So, for example, for things like you know credit card debts or loans and what have you, the way it works is that if the, the agreement makes provision for... Uh, when the money is due to be paid, that's the period in time that, that it may well be for the five years to start uh, counting, which failing when there's a written demand for payment. Now, we've got, at Government Law Centre, we've got cases before the Sheriff Appeal Court in Scotland, and it's involving these big UK international companies that buy up debt. And you may say, why do they buy up debt? Well, they buy up debt because the Basel Committee and the European Union has been pushing the banks after the financial crisis to get rid of what's called NPLs, uh, um, non-performing loans. So what they do is they sell the loans, mainstream banks, to companies that then chase them. So this is a massive international industry. Now, the cases we've got are, like, for example, six years uh, or, or, or from the last payment that, that our client in Glasgow uh, has paid. But the way it works is that they're able to then say, but hang on, the start point should be from when we did the written demand. So you can actually create a longer period than five years under the existing law by doing a written demand at a later point. And what we're arguing is, no, actually, you know, like the credit card agreement with originally with Virgin, then another bank, and then da 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 da, makes provision for the last payment. Um, and you get into folk hiring advocates to argue how many angels are dancing on the head of a pin. <coughs> now, 
I think the solution, this is what certainly my colleagues at Government Law Centre think, is that why don't we just simply say, you know, for the purposes of uh, the start point for the five-year period, uh, in terms of, for example, debts, it could be the last payment made. Um, now, there's already provision in the legislation for acknowledging stuff that, as, as Mike says, can extend it. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not like it's balanced. But if we're really going to simplify things, we could just simply say the last payment that's made by the debtor, that's the, the ticking point. Now, that then creates the policy objective of what the government's trying to do is to say, if you're a creditor, you've got five years to get this money. And if you can't get the money within five years, then it prescribes. I just add to uh, what Mike has just said about the, the issue with the credit cards. This is an issue that we're facing in our uh, citizens advice bureaus as well, where uh, people are coming in uh, with uh, trying to um, work out what the actual um, date is when prescriptions should be measured from. Uh, if they contact the creditor, the creditor's got one view. Uh, obviously, we have another view. Um, and it actually makes it very difficult for a debtor to represent themselves or even for a lay representative to go and argue in cases where, uh, which have gone to court. And you know we would need the services of somebody like Mike to go and uh, argue on behalf of the client. Uh, but coming back to your question about the practical difficulties of council tax over 20 years, uh, I can give you a few examples. The way um, that money is collected, often it goes into different accounts for different years. Um, so what can happen is that uh, the the debtor thinks that the, the oldest account has been paid, um, but actually the money is going to a, a more recent account. And then when the sheriff officer contacts them 10, 15 years later to say, you still owe this money, they can't understand why you know the oldest account has, has remained unpaid. Um, the issue that Mike already brought up as well regarding sequestration, uh, we would, as our advisors would see clients who have built up council tax debts over 10, 11, 12 years without any action apparently coming from um, the council to, to, to collect those debts prior to that point. And to be quite honest, I think those people had got to the point where they think they were getting away with it. Uh, but then to suddenly receive uh, a writ out of the blue to say that they're going to be sequestrated. Mm -hmm. And they can't understand how they go from apparently inaction to um, drastic action, uh, which will have an impact on uh, any property that they own. Um, and if there was a five-year prescriptive period, that would force creditors, all creditors, to actually actively try to enforce their debt and perhaps put off the need for things like sequestration by councils. Mm -hmm. okay. mm, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So in a nutshell, councils wouldn't wouldn't be able to allow debt to build up because they would have to act within five years. Yeah, and, and, and they have the means. Yes, and that's, that's what happens in terms of housing law, because if you think about housing law, uh, the Scottish Parliament introduced the pre-action requirements, uh, indeed both for, for homeowners and for people in the uh, social rented sector, and that requires uh, uh, social landlords, for example, uh, to... Uh, ultimately raise proceedings for eviction and for payment uh, once they've went through a process of trying to help the person. You know, so, so the rest of our system's kind of geared towards making sure that you can sort out, maximise people's incomes through, getting advice through, whether it's going to CEBs or other agencies. Um, and this just seems out of kilter. And, and just a final point, Convener, for me, which is that um, in terms of the backdating period, I've checked with the power of technology, uh, and it's one month for housing benefit is all you can backdate it. Three if you're of pension age, um, which is... Show, it's show for housing it's benefit, it's reserve it. benefit we were, we're, we're trying to find out about. Yeah. So, you know, the other reserve benefit. The vote, I mean, I think the nub of it is that the periods that one could backdate it have been shortened over time. Absolutely. Yeah. OK. Finish. Right. Bill Bowen. Thank you, convener. Morning. Um, I have some questions on the discoverability test. Um, Section 5 of the bill sets out the new test associated with the start date for five-year prescription in relation to the obligation to pay damages. The Scottish Law Commission um, consulted on four options for Section 5 of the bill before deciding to use its option 3. And I'll just quickly run through them. These were option 1, keeping the law in Morrison, option 2, going back to the law as understood before Morrison, option 3, 
going back to the old law, but adding the requirement that the pursuer must know the identity of the defender and option four, leaving it to the court's discretion. As a matter of policy, which option do you favour and why? And are there any drawbacks to the option now set out in section five? And please, if you have examples to, to give, do so. Um, yes, no, thank you, Mr Donnelly. I, 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 do, I do think the UK Supreme Court applied the law as as passed, you know, as 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 is. Um, but it's often the case that I mean, I can think back to the House of Lords when things uh, the Awu judgment in homelessness, where the Scottish Parliament reversed that uh, with the House in Scotland Act 2001, because you, you weren't entitled to a secure uh, home uh, from the House of Lords decision back in the 90s. Uh, so, so the Scottish Parliament often um, corrects, you know, uh, a legal uh, position because it's not seemed to be fair. And I think option three is so. I think w what what the bill has uh, uh, in section five uh, is just pure common sense. I mean, I mean, so so the, so the, you know, the Morrison against ICL Plastics Limited, uh, I think, created an absurdity in that you could you could be. Uh, in a situation where you did not know uh, who was the uh, uh, who was the cause of negligence, uh, and yet the time's ticking away because you know you've got an injury, but there's no, I mean, so who are you supposed to sue? Now, I suppose in theory you could say, well, we'll just sue everybody we think might be, but you still could end up missing the correct uh, defender. Now, so just from a pure kind of logical point of view, I think that case just showed that the law needed to be needed to be changed. And I think what the the law commissions kind of come down on and what the bills come down on is just pure common sense that the time should start ticking from when you have suffered an injury or loss uh, and uh, it, it's because of fault or negligence and you know who is responsible. And I have to say, final point is that, remember this is in the context of se Section 11.3 of the 1973 Act, so it's not a subjective, do I know these things? It's an objective legal test, which is that um, you ought to you know, have known uh, these things. So I, I, think, I think the bill is absolutely right in terms of that provision. I would agree it makes sense, but um, damages is not really an area that we would advise uh, people on, so I'd defer here to Mike in this case. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, Last week we heard some oral evidence to the effect that the third part of the new test in Section 5, the requirement that the pursuer know the identity of the defender, might increase the complexity of the law in some situations. For example, where there are multiple potential defenders, um, different prescriptive periods could run in relation to each defender, depending on when each defender became known to or ought to have become known to the pursuer. We also discussed how the third part of the test might work in a situation where there was joint and several liability for a debt. Do, do you think that the, there is a risk that the third part of the new test is, um, will overly complicate things? Um, alternatively, should we be supporting it as, for example, something that increases fairness in the law? Uh, I, I would agree, uh, Mr Donnelly, that, that it creates fairness. I think we need to put it in the context that the, those examples that are given where it can become incredibly complicated are not the um, mainstream scenarios. Uh, the, these, the, you know, where, you, where you've got a, a, a multiplicity uh, of potential defenders uh, is, is not, I mean, certainly in terms of personal injury cases that I've done over the years, um, it's, more, it's more the case that there's been possibly two in the types of cases that I've dealt with. And sometimes I've ended up suing both, and then one drops out when 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 you get it sorted, which is not ideal, but it, it, it's workable. Um, I think what the bill is trying to do is to say, if it, nobody is aware, if, if if the if the pursuer is not aware of who actually was ultimately responsible for the fault, the negligence, the injury, then surely it's right and proper that when they become aware or ought to have become aware, the time period starts running. I don't think that that can be seen as unfair, and I think. Yes, you may argue it creates the potential for more than one time period to run, but the only alternative you have against that is just to have one period for everything, and then the the um, person who suffered loss and injury loses out, and that can't be right. I would agree. As I say, we don't advise on this area. Okay, thank you. Finish with that? Okay. Um, so I'll ask about the start date of 20-year prescription. Uh, which is in section 8, 
um, where the bill proposes a new start date for 20-year prescription. Can you say whether or not you support that? I think you've touched, you've touched on uh, five-year, Mr Daly, but what about this 20 years? I, I would rather leave it as it is. I, I don't see what... I don't see... I mean, from reading the uh, uh, policy memorandum and the excellent briefing from Spice uh, on the bill, uh, it seems that the rationale is because the pendulum has swung for uh, Section 5 of the bill in favour of pursuers... Um, let's swing the pendulum a bit in the other direction uh, for uh, potential defenders in terms of the 20 period long. I mean, that seems to come out there. Now, that makes sense. I'm not quite sure it works like that in real life, though. I mean, what is the problem with the, tw the, the current position with 20 years? I have to say, in terms of um, the provision in Section 6 of the bill, which would um, remove interruptions to that 20 year period, uh, I, I could certainly be more sympathetic to that because I think that, that, that could be a fair compromise. But I suppose the reason that I have a, a difficulty with it, and again, these are probably unusual cases that would happen, but when they, when they, if they did happen, they would be catastrophic. So, for example, you know, examples about um, if the law was changed, so it's just a simple kind of 20-year period, if you've got def defects in buildings, latent defects that only uh, come to light... 20 years down the line, then it's game over for the consumer. It's game over under this provision. And I have to say, I'm not suggesting that there's lots of cases like that, but there will be cases like that. And I just think, why don't we just leave, um, as I say, my, my, my uh, government law sense preference would be no need for Section 8. Uh, by all means, have Section 6. Um, and that would be, I think, a, a much better outcome. Again, sorry, we have no opinion on Section 8 either, but uh, Section 6 with a long stop on prescription uh, is certainly something that we'll be pushing for. So, uh, I mean, in the case you mentioned where you, you could get um, defects in buildings, which could appear after, after, after a long time, mm. is it not fair that you have, you have some sort of cut-off? But, but maybe you would, Convener, because... And I, and I, and I, this, this, this actually happens all the time in financial services. But what, what, what we've done with financial services is we've created a financial compensation scheme that covers scenarios um, where, for example, the construction, well, where, where businesses go uh, out of the uh, out of business. So, if you think about the existing law, if we did nothing about the the twenty year uh, period, then if a business is no longer trading then there is, what, what is your comeback? Um, if the business is trading, I mean, it will have insurance, one would have thought. Um, and I suppose that the, when you drill it down, it's about the, the equity of if that was caused by the fault. So it's not just any old mistake, it has to be negligence. So let's say it's the negligence of the, the builder and it only comes to light, you know, 20 years down the line. Why shouldn't, that builder in principle be liable. That, I mean, that must be the logical kind of explanation because the alternative is to say, well, it's tough luck for, for the homeowner. So do you have no limit? No, I think just leave the law as it is. Right. <laughs> uh, so what, uh, what we're suggesting is um, yeah, you could simply delete Section 8 of the bill um, uh, no difficulty with Section 6, which is what I'm saying is the compromise, because obviously that could then be interrupted, so it could be more than 20. But if you just want to keep the law as it is for that, I think we would be happy. And as I say, the reason it seems to be, the reason it seems that we seem to have Section 8 is some very peculiar uh, idea that because of the ICL plastics case, we need to do something for uh, uh, businesses. Um, now, Section 8, uh, again, some concerns being expressed by stakeholders, including the Law Society and the Faculty of Advocates, about how it would work in relation to omissions to act and ongoing breaches. Uh, the Scottish Law Commission said in oral evidence to the committee that the language used in Section 8 would be familiar to the courts uh, from another part of the 1973 Act, and so it couldn't see a difficulty. But what? What's your view? 
I, I think I would tend to agree with 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 that opinion. Um, the, the act act or omission is is a, is a term of art. Okay. No. Okay, doke. Um, Mr. Finley, we're back to you. Um, <coughs> the uh, Parliament has had a petition from Mr. Patterson in relation to a conveyancing case. Um, uh, that went badly wrong uh, for him and uh, indeed um, I have to declare an interest here in that I have um, um, worked with uh, Mike Daly on a, a pretty similar case, conveyancing case, um, where um, uh, another uh, two homeowners um, suffered greatly for almost 20 years because of a conveyance case that went badly wrong. Uh, and. Um, they could not get remedy through the normal processes. Um, the issue that's been raised here is about the harshness of these cases and how the prescription period has been very severe in dealing with this case and, and others like it. I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, yes, and um, I, I mean, as, as, as Mr Finlay has said, we worked together in the Happy Valley cases and there were other cases, I think, in, in Aberdeenshire, uh, and the Herald certainly ran a campaign uh, and we got a satisfactory result uh, after I don't know how many years. Um, on that, the the potential is there for this problem oh. to exist again and again and again. I mean, I mean, if I can give an example, I mean, and I've read um, uh, the position in terms of Mr. Patterson's case, and it's and it's horrendous. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I would give this analogy. Um, so you could go into a shop to buy a toaster. And it doesn't work. So you're entitled to get a new toaster or you're entitled to get your money back. You go into a solicitor's office to buy a house. Turns out it's defective. You don't actually own it or there's some horrendous thing. Um, they then get experts from uh, high and, 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 and mighty uh, uh, professors of law and da 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 who say, well, actually, it's not negligence. And that goes on for, 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 you know, for 10 years or whatever. So you, you have the position where you go into a solicitor's office to buy a house, which is kind of like what you have to do, and you end up not owning a house and you've paid their bill. Yet you can go into a shop and buy a toaster and get a new toaster or get your money back. How have we created in this country a situation? And I have to say, it's the fault of solicitors and the law society because I think the solution to Mr. Patterson's case, I have to say, is not to be found in prescription. I think the solution to Mr. Patterson's case is that the Law Society of Scotland should introduce a system of strict liability so that anybody that buys a house through a solicitor, through a Scottish solicitor, and it turns out, for whatever reason, you know, because it's complicated, that they don't own it and there's a defect, that that is put right, and we have an insurance policy that we all pay into to put that right, because it won't happen that often, but it will happen, and it's catastrophic. And the Law Society could do that tomorrow if they've wanted. I've certainly suggested that they do it, and they haven't. And the uh, legal profession is currently under review. There's a, a review that the Scottish Government uh, has uh, 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 commissioned. And I think that this is something that's long overdue, that, that it cannot be right that you could buy property in this country and end up having 20 years or 30 years not owning it and becoming ill uh, because you're trying to argue, was it negligent? that the solicitor got it wrong. That's just wrong. It should be strict liability. The insurance company refusing to um, take any role in that. I mean, at least if you buy a toaster, you're unlikely to get taken to court for somebody to get the toaster back off you, yes. um, which is what happens in these cases also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's just, I, honestly, I mean, and I'm a solicitor, and I have to say, I'm ashamed that this is the position that we have. And I think it's wrong, and I've spoken out about it, and I've spoken to... Uh, the past president of the Law Society, I've spoken to the chief executive, um, and they, sh they should do something about it. And if they don't, I think this parliament needs to do something about it. We, we do have the draft members bill sitting still potentially ready to go. Indeed. Anyway, I've probably not won any friends. <laughs> <laughs> What's new? <laughs> to win friends, Mr Downey. Uh, partly so. <laughs> uh, Mr Holmey, have you got any experience? Yeah, uh, it, well, I would agree that, uh, you know, from a consumer point of view, it's totally unsatisfactory that somebody doesn't end up owning a house after paying for a service. So uh, I think Mike's solution is uh, probably the best uh, in terms of dealing with that, because there's always going to be bad cases that arise out of whatever time limit you set. Okay. Is that you, Mr Finlay? Okay. 
Um, Tom Arthur. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. I think much of what I wanted to touch on has already been covered. Um, but just for the point of clarification, I'm address this specifically to Mr Daly. Um, with regards to 20-year prescription, what are your views on um, ending the possibility of interruption? I, I think I think we're quite relaxed about it. Um, um, uh, I think... Uh, the, the legal position at present is if you acknowledge the existence of the obligation, the existence of the obligation, then the 20 years still continues. Um, and Mike had talked about earlier in terms of how that works for council tax, so it's, it's not such a big thing to have five years. Um, so I, I think we're, we're, we're reasonably relaxed um, uh, with uh, section six of the bill. Um, I think what's much more important um, is, is section eight, which we've talked about, which is much more potentially um, f um, fundamental, you know, because it's effectively extinguishing the right completely. And just one further point of clarification for the benefit of committee, would you, what are your views on, because there has been some suggestion of this as a, an option, interruption taking the form of a pause, which can be recommenced, taking into account the time it's already elapsed? So I think, Mr Arthur, that's section 13 of the bill, and I feel very uneasy and un, 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 unhappy about that. I think, I think the danger is that, if you think about it from a perspective that, that, that law centres and CEBs and money advice agencies uh, will, will, will have people come into them, but often people don't come to these free agencies in Scotland. And what happens is they negotiate directly with the creditor. Now, if the creditor is to say, do you know what, I'm going to do you a favour here, let's have this pause, let's have this uh, uh, period of a year. You're probably going to agree to that. You're probably going to say, well, actually, I'm in, you know, I've got all these other things going on in my life. I'm under stress, I'm under pressure. Uh, delay it another year. What, what do I care, right? So I, I think our preference would be not having Section 13, but clearly I can see that there's, there's a kind of an intellectual argument to say that in certain circumstances it could be useful if parties are... Are, are of e a quality of arms. And uh, so I, I get that. So I think if we're going to have Section 13, I would be happy, with, certainly, with Section 13 if we just protected the consumer in terms of vulnerability. And we could easily do that by requiring the consumer to, for example, uh, have went to a solicitor uh, or, indeed, um, it could be you know, an accredited money advisor to, to, to certify that they've been given advice. We could do that. Now, we do that with employment law. So if somebody you know, settles with an employer, they just can't do it themselves. They have to get somebody to give them independent advice. And the reason I'm saying also an accredited money advisor is so you don't have to pay. I mean, you can come to a law centre solicitor or accredited money advisor, and that could be done for free just to make sure that you're not being pushed into it. So to characterise your mm. position, it's, you have concerns, but you think they could be mitigated by having these safeguards in place? Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. And so, so this is really to get get around the danger of the kind of weaker party um, being uh, abused, if you like. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would agree uh, that, that there should be a safeguard in place yeah. uh, for the consumer because most consumers aren't aware of their rights, so they could easily sign them away uh, if somebody, um, as Mike says, presents it in a certain way to them. Um, and given that with debt cases, which is what we primarily deal with, uh, you know, the whole point is has this debt. Uh, been extinguished, uh, you know, to ask them the, for the, the debtor to have that extended by another year just doesn't make any sense. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do any members have any other questions that may have occurred to them? No? Uh, anything you wish to add that we've not covered? <laughs> no, I, I think that's been very comprehensive, Convener, and I think, I think myself and Citizens of East Scotland uh, uh, Government Law Centre, uh, we're very much agreeing, I think, on everything from, from very much from a consumer yeah. perspective. And I think, I think the bill is uh, welcomed and I think the bill does do uh, uh, good things, but I think it could do a lot more good things if only the committee uh, could suggest <laughs> some amendments. <laughs> have some useful suggestions. <laughs> yeah. so, um, listen, can I... Thank you very much for coming in. It's been a very useful, a short session, but uh, we've covered a lot. Um, and I, I thank you very much. I'll suspend the meeting briefly to allow you to uh, leave.